Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Cathy Lett. I'm a, an author, deranged mother of two, investigative satirist and feminist, which is why I'm so thrilled to be chairing this panel today. I think women are each other's human wonder bras, uplifting, supportive, and making each other look bigger and better, don't you think, girls? <laughs> Who's here with their human wonder bra today? Have a little cuddle. I know you want to. Um, boys, by the way, you may be ovulating by the end of the session, but you know, just a warning. Um, Today's discussion, discussion is called Women Under Fire, and I so wish we didn't have to still be having sessions like this, because it's still a man's world. A hundred years since Emily Pankhurst tied herself to the railings, we still don't have equal pay. We're getting concussion hitting our head on the glass ceiling, and we're supposed to clean it while we're up there. Um, we've got a pussy grabber as a president. We've got abortion rights being rolled back in America. We've got a, a prime minister here who says the best way to deal with female colleagues is to pat them on the bottom and then ignore them. So I think any woman who calls herself a post-feminist has kept her wonder bra and burnt her brains because we still have a long way to go. So hopefully we're going to solve so, some of those conundrums today. Um, and the only other thing I would say, anyone who thinks women aren't still under fire, the sexism is innate in the language. A, a, a man who's good at his work is you know, a go-getter, leadership material, assertive. A woman is still a bitch, a ball breaker. A man who's sexually active is still a love god, a stud muffin, a spunk rat, Lothario, a Romeo. A woman with the same sexual appetites is a slut, a tart, a tramp, a mole. Men still expect you to be so virginal. It's like when they say, oh, darling, darling, am I the first man to make love to you? To which the woman replies, of course. I don't know why you men keep asking the same silly question. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, moving on. Uh, the women on stage with me today are challenging sexist stereotypes and kicking ass in their own unique way. You can call them outliers, pioneers, innovators, or women who just don't give a damn about following the rules. Creative and, above all, courageous. These women take aim at misogyny, <coughs> racism, and hypocrisy, then shoot from the lip. Articulate, passionate, eloquent. They all have black belts in Tung Fu. <laughs> so let me introduce you. Um, First, uh, let's welcome Alif Shafak over here. Alif is an award-winning novelist and the most widely read female author in Turkey. She's published 17 books, 11 of which are novels. Her latest novel, 10 Minutes, 38 Seconds in the Strange World, has been shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. Her work has been translated into 50 languages. Mm -hmm. Alif holds a PhD in political science and has taught at various universities in Turkey, the US and the UK, including St. Sam's College, Oxford, where she's an honorary fellow. I left school at 16. The only examination I've ever passed is my cervical smear test, so I'm feeling a little bit in awe right now. Um, she's a member of the WE Forum Global Agenda Council on Creative Economy and a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, an advocate for women's rights, LGBT rights and freedom of speech. Alif has also been awarded the title of, we can't pronounce it, Chevalier. Anyone speak French? Chevalier, that thing. De arts, de letters, anyone? Anyone? No. Okay. Um, uh, she, anyway, she's judged numerous literary prizes and is also chairing the, the Welcome Prize this year. In 2017, she was chosen by Politico as one of the 12 people who could make the world better. Could you just hurry up on that? Because <laughs> the, we're in a bit of a deep doo-doo right now. Um, now, sitting here on my left is Luciana Berger. Bar, Berger, Berger. Ber Berger. Getting it right, yeah. She was elected as a member of parliament for Liverpool Wavetree in 2010. She's held very shadow ministerial positions, including shadow ministries for energy and climate change, public health and mental health. Um, Luciana is a member of the Health and Social Care Select Committee. Having left the Labour Party in February, she currently sits as an independent member of parliament. Yes? No. What's happened? You've I changed? Joined, I joined the Liberal Democrats. You joined the Lib Dems now? Yeah. yeah. Oh! <laughs> It's not updated on your Wikipedia. I've also had a it's baby. It's not updated on her. And she's had a baby yeah. as well. That's not on her Wikipedia either. Um, <laughs> don't believe everything you read on Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, she's also uh, received a number of awards for her work, including the Joe Cox Memorial Award for Bravery and Heroism, right? And the Jewish Care Woman of Distinction Award. Luciana is featured in this year's Vogue 25 list of 25 high powered and visionary women whose work is shaping Britain's future. Well, it's all gone a bit pear-shaped, Dal, so if you could reshape that fast, that'd be fantastic. And in the middle here, we have the fabulous and formidable Ian Hersey Ali. 
Um, I'm firebrand activist and agitator. Ian is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, and founder of the AHA Foundation. She served as a member of the Dutch Parliament from 2003 to 2006. While in Parliament, she focused on furthering the integration of non-Western immigrants into Dutch society and on defending the rights of Muslim women. She's written several books, including Infidel, Nomad from Islam to America, Personal Journey Through the Class of Civilization, and Heretic, Why Islam Needs a Reformation, now. Prior to joining the Hoover Institution, she was a fellow at Harvard University and a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. She's also got a master's degree in political science, so um, we'll be looking to you to explain to us, you know, why Boris and Trump keep going around talking about the size of their elections endlessly and lying. So that's your job today. So before we don, our psychological scuba gear, and, and let's don our start again, Kat. Let's don our psychological scuba gear and dive into the deep end by asking each of these formidable women up here today to say how you feel under fire right now and what you're doing about it. Who wants to go first? I'd say keep calm and carry on. That's what we do. <laughs> the British way. <laughs> the British way. Yes, that's actually the best approach when you're under fire. Is Keep calm and carry on. But how are you feeling under fire right now? Calm. <laughs> right, okay. She's calm, excellent. How are you feeling under fire right now? Ali? I really don't know where to begin because I'm a novelist and depending on, I mean, each novel can upset someone else. So it's endless. Um, and I think we all know that it's hard to write about political taboos. But sometimes we do not perhaps realize that it's equally challenging to write about sexual taboos mm -hmm. and to question gender roles and gender discrimination. So that too is a minefield. Um, just very briefly, maybe I can share this with you. I had a taste of this in 2006. I wrote a novel called The Bastard of Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And that novel spoke about the Armenian genocide, which is a big taboo in Turkey. Still, it's one of our biggest silences. Mm -hmm. When the novel came out, um, I, I was put on trial for insulting Turkishness, even though nobody quite knows what that means. There were nationalist mobs on the streets, you know, spitting at my pictures, burning EU flags. And it was quite surreal too, because my Turkish lawyer had to defend my Armenian fictional characters in the courtroom, <laughs> because the words of the fictional characters were taken out. And even when I was acquitted, I had to live with a bodyguard for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Fast forward, I wish I could say we have made progress since then. I think it got even worse and worse. So anyone who deals with words in Turkey and countries like Turkey, mm -hmm. but Turkey is not the only place, knows that you can get into trouble so easily. And right now my work is being investigated, this time for writing about sexuality and mm -hmm. issues like child rights, child abuse. Mm -hmm. I gave a TED talk um, last year uh, uh, in which I also mentioned that I was bisexual. And after that, about seven weeks unending, you know, constant, I had abuse. Not only social media, because the digital world makes everything worse, but also Islamist papers calling me pervert, nationalist papers, pro-government papers. So it's, it's, it's endless. Mm. And I wish I could say it doesn't affect me. It does affect me. Mm. I think we are hurt, upset, bruised. We're full of bruises. Mm. But there's something else that perhaps helps us. Either our, this could be our love, our faith in what we do. In, in my case, I love literature. I love writing. Mm. I love books. It's as simple as that. Mm. Mm. Fantastic answer. And what about you, Luciana? Uh, say? Well, I mean, we meet today after what has been probably one of the most if not the most tumultuous week I've experienced in the House of Commons. And unfortunately, uh, the, the question, how am I under fire? I was the subject of a, a, a big report in The Guardian only yesterday, mm. uh, alongside a number of other female members of parliament, where we were asked and we catalogued just some of the hate that we are unfortunately subject to. Uh, it's not even daily, sometimes it's an hourly or by minute basis. Um, I find myself in the unusual situation of, of finding, well, if you look at the Venn diagram, I, I sit in a number of different concentric circles. I'm a woman, uh, as we're discussing today, I'm a younger woman, uh, and I'm Jewish. Uh, the combination of which, and I'm also um, very, very, very pro-Remain and have been at the forefront of a lot of the work that's been going on around Brexit. Uh, the combination of which means that, literally, I mean, you look at my social media timelines, I'm called a traitor, literally it's on an hourly basis or a, some variation of that and I've seen now uh, six people convicted of the harassment and the 
anti-Semitism that they have directed at me. And I only got notification only yesterday that yet another case is in front of the CPS and is due to, um, well, we'll see what happens as a result of that. But I'm, I'm collecting them and it's not something that uh, when I put myself forward for public office, I necessarily uh, expected would um, be the case. But in terms of how I deal with it, I, you know, your question was, you know, how, how we mm. define what, what we're doing about it. I mean, it doesn't... In some ways, it encourages me. I mean, it, it buoys me on because I'm not going to be cowed by uh, what is sent in my direction. I am, however, mindful that I um, have a wonderful support network in the family and friends and the team that uh, work with me. Um, I, happened, I happen to you know, have the platform and I get more than my fair share because I am on the national stage. And I also happen to be pretty resilient. But I think there's, you know, talks mm. to what Alif was saying, you know, there are moments at which... You know, when I was the subject of a, a, a social media campaign which saw me getting thousands of message, uh, messages in just one day alone using the hashtag filthy Jew bitch. Mm. Yeah. Forgive me for sharing it, but you know, this is this to, to share with you, know, you know, what this results in. You, know, you can't even, doing your best to insulate yourself, you can't, hurt, you know, you can't not be affected by it. Mm. Um, so I'm very mindful that I happen to be pretty resilient, but at a featured moment, you know, mm. it might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm -hmm. And in some way, that's also encouraged me to carry on with the, lots of work that I do around campaigning around mental health, because we all have mental health, and at any moment it can be affected. So mm. um, I try and protect myself as much as possible by turning off things like notifications of social media. I don't, don't have any notifications whatsoever anymore. Um, and so I, you know, try and not, uh, I try not to see the stuff that comes in, in my direction. And yeah, so we can talk, I think we can talk more about the positives that we can all make. And yeah, I mean, we were talking in the green room about how long we've been feminists and how slow it is to get progress. Yeah. And we were saying how what we really need is for men to join us at the barricades. Mm -hmm. And it's not as though we're asking for a lot, equal pay, great. We'd like them to work out that mutual orgasm is not an insurance company, that'd be great, you know? <laughs> I would like them to do a little light housework because it's in their interest, scientifically proven that no woman ever shot her husband while he was vacuuming. Mm -hmm. And maybe learn to do a little light cooking, which, you know, what does a woman really want in bed? Breakfast, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> but do you think, how can we get men more involved with the women's movement? Any, any brilliant thoughts? I left my husband at home with the kids. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think men are involved, actually. Um, I, I think what's wrong with feminism today, as opposed to feminism maybe 100 years ago, um, is that we've made enemies of men when they're not. Um, my, I'm a huge fan of a man called John Stuart Mill. Uh, in 1869, he wrote an essay, and he argued for the rights of women. Uh, the title of the essay is Subjection of Women. And I think that there are more, he, he wasn't the only one, he isn't unique. Um, there are more men who are on our side. I think the way to get men involved is not to make enemies of men. Uh, I have a husband whom I love. I think he's the greatest feminist alive today. I have two sons. Um, that I've given birth to, and then I have two more that I acquired along the way. And if I think of these you know, boys and men in my life, I think the best way to get them involved is to make friends of them. It's to love them, and it is to stop the hostility towards women. Mm. So I'm absolutely against this neo-feminism that just takes men, makes them the enemy. And I, I that's, don't, that's not my experience of feminism in any way, but what would you say? I beg to differ, but okay, go ahead. I, I, I really think we, we're at a crucial crossroads. You know, this is, a, in my opinion, an important moment for global solidarity and global sisterhood. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have so much to learn from feminist movements of past generations. And we also need to understand where are the gaps. There are important rifts, fractures within women's movement that we need to be aware of. Sometimes these are because of class barriers, sometimes because of cultural barriers, sometimes because of race. So we have some difficult issues to talk about. And I think it's incredibly important that we empower each other mm -hmm. and we listen to each other and we connect across borders. Because what we've seen, particularly since the last years, we do now know that history can go backwards. And wherever we've seen an increase in populist nationalism, populist authoritarianism, 
we will also see an increase immediately in sexism, misogyny and homophobia. Mm. It's not a coincidence, they go hand in hand. Mm. So countries like Turkey, Brazil, Philippines, Russia, we have a long list of examples in each of these countries, wherever there was an increase in ultranationalism, tribalism, or religious fundamentalism, or, or populism of mm -hmm. some kind, or toxic politics that affects all of us, mm -hmm. we've seen an increase in misogyny. So I think women have much more to lose when countries go backwards. Mm -hmm. That's why it is important that we connect today. And I agree with you. I think it's an important moment also to reach out. Mm -hmm. Rather than retreating into tribes, my ideal women's movement, uh, I'm a feminist, I've learned a lot from feminist movements of the past, and my ideal feminist movement is one that goes hand in hand with LGBTQ rights. Mm -hmm. We're all, all on the same boat, but also reaches out to men. And I think we need to talk about masculinity rather than men versus women, because masculinity can be a straitjacket as well. Mm -hmm. And again, countries like Turkey have sh shown us, when I look at honor killings, honor-based crimes, there's a lot of pressure on particularly young men, but not only in that part of the world, everywhere, particularly on men, young men coming from disadvantaged <coughs> backgrounds, mental health issues. So the new feminism can also give answers to these and show that we are all in this together and it is in our best interest to fight against patriarchy mm -hmm. and populist nationalism and far right together. What would you say, Lou? I mean, that the patri feminism is good for men as well because the patriarchy is repressive for the male of the species. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, I mean, I think there's, there's a number of different challenges. The, the, what we see now, you know, is the, the, the important point about the rise in populism, wherever we, we may find it, you know, we're seeing that coupled with a rise in the misogyny and sexism. So that already diminishes the number of men that might be part of our shared endeavour. Mm. Um, it's great to see more men kind of using the hashtag feminist, for example. Mm. Um, but they, you know, they, they're also amongst, you know, uh, Amongst men, they have also people that are perpetrating the misogyny and sexism, uh, and whether that's you know in the Western world, the Middle East, wherever it may be. So mm -hmm. we have many challenges, uh, mm -hmm. I think, on that front. Um, I mean, I, I I have I have a number of men to thank for the fact that I'm here because they encouraged me to get involved in politics. It wasn't actually women, but um, my biggest thing that I get involved in to try and challenge this is about how we get more women involved. And I think for as long as, you know, whatever field or sector it is that women are in the minority, mm. that allows the unusualness to continue. It means that, um, that it's something different. And for, when you have that equality, whether it's, you know, on pay or the proportion of women in a workplace or the proportion of women in a certain field or whether mm. it's the House of Commons where we are still only 31%, mm. for as long as we're seen as something different and unusual, then I think that then allows the misogyny and the sexism to... to Continue. Barish. Well, you had just mentioned women in the workplace, mm. and I wanted to ask you a question about that. Because mm. all the research shows that whenever a man and woman start talking at the same time, the woman pulls back. You know, we're still too demure in some ways. And Sheryl Sandberg has been promoting the idea that um, women have to lean in more. But I'm always worried I'm going to lean in so far, I'm going to fall flat on my face. But <laughs> what do you think about Sheryl Sandberg's approach to women in the workplace? So I take a slightly different view, and I think it's that we all have to step up. I think that again, that's as mm. much for men as it is for women. Like it's for men to step up to share in the challenges that women face, and it's for women to step up. I mean, I just, uh, I think it's very interesting what she's written and what she said. But uh, this idea that you have to kind of compensate and you have to kind of, you know, it's, it's just a different take. It's you know, it's not wildly different. But um, again, I think we've all got a responsibility. We, you know, I've got a responsibility to the people that I represent. I've got a responsibility to my children. You know, to mm. give, you know, to set an example to them. And I think it's just about how we all participate mm. and that it should be on the same level so we're all stepping up in that way. Did you want to mention, say anything on that topic? Yeah, I think yeah. one thing that left a huge impact on me over the years is um, as a novelist I've been to, sometimes I go to schools and, and get a chance to talk to students, very different age groups. And one thing that I've noticed over and over, particularly across the Middle East, is when you, but, but maybe I should say everywhere, when you talk to seven-year-old, eight-year-old kids, yeah. It's just fascinating to see how much chutzpah, how much confidence, how much creativity they have. And at that age, girls are just as confident as boys, if not even more. Mm -hmm. And if you ask them, is there anyone in this room who would like to become a writer someday? So many hands go up, they want to be poets, they want to be artists. And then I would go to high schools to give talks and everything has changed, everything. Nobody wants to be a novelist anymore, nobody wants to be a poet anymore, and girls have become timid. Mm. We have taught them through school, schooling, uh, uh, family, you know, 
the neighborhood, whatever, it, social yes. media, we've taught them just to be careful, you know, what you say, just don't stand out, just blend in, yeah. be aware that you will be judged. And then once you internalize that, you don't, you don't even have to hear other people because you're constantly judging yourself and that pulls us down and down and down. We and have I, to break that vicious so, circle. It, 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 I want to jump in here and say, Ali, what you say is absolutely right. Mm. If you are growing up in a context where the culture, the general culture and the religion, the prevailing culture of the moment is, as young girls, you know, the confidence, um, the go-getter, the do-it-all, that is squashed. I think we will be more successful as feminists if we make a distinction between that world and the world that we live in today. I think all four of us sitting here today and all of you women in the audience, you live in Britain, America, any of the liberal Western societies, we have to check our privilege. We have the privilege of being equal before the law. We have the privilege of going to school. And what really annoys me, annoys me about feminists today is when they start to conflate these two worlds. When you get the handmaid's tale of American women donning these red um, burkas, basically, and pretending that they live in Gilead, or that Donald Trump uh, uh, compromises their rights. When they conflate that with the situation in the Middle East, the situation in South Asia, the situation in Africa, I really, that's the moment I want to say, I don't want to call myself a feminist, and I don't want to be a part of them. If we check our privileges, the privilege, privileges we have in Western liberal societies as women, then as feminists, yes, we could spread it to the rest of the world, but not if we pretend that we're equal victims, we're not. Mm. Do you want to step in on that? Mm. We're not. <coughs> LGBTQ, great. But now, what have women fought for in the West? We wanted to take part in Olympics. We wanted to have our own bathrooms. We wanted to have our own spaces. Then come the LGBTQ people. I'm an LGBTQ activist. I would love them to have everything they want. But for them to come and into a, a man with a beard and hair on his coming into my bathroom, I would say, no. <laughs> and you must. And I don't think we should conflate these issues. That's the thing that we need to get going. You know, I, I have lived long years in Istanbul, and a couple of times I've heard, with all the good intentions, American scholars, I never forget one very good scholar telling me that it was very understandable for me to be a feminist, because after all, I lived in Turkey. And I just wanted to tell to her, that it wasn't understandable for me that she, why she wasn't a feminist, because after all, she lived in America. So what I'm trying to say is patriarchy is universal. It, all, it doesn't only exist in the Middle East or some parts of the world. Of course, it is much more dense or concentrated in some parts of the world, but we're all in this struggle together. Mm -hmm. And I think until particularly the year 2016, there was this distinction in the world as if some, kind, some parts of the world were solid lands, right? Solid, safe, steady, the Western world. And you really didn't need to fight for human rights there. You really didn't need to fight for freedom of speech there or for women's rights because they were already democratic enough. Mm -hmm. So what was the big deal? And, it, and those things were needed in other parts of the world, freedom of speech and human rights and women's rights. I think after 2016, this dualistic way of seeing the world has been shattered to pieces. Mm -hmm. Now we know that there's no such thing as solid lands versus liquid lands, and we're all living in liquid times. So even in those parts of America where we think women's rights have been achieved, things can go back Sit too back. fast, I as really we are seeing right now with, that. with abortion I rights. I think that with we, the we fact can't that we are, take it for granted I live like that. in America, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have child marriage. We don't there have female there. genital mutilation. We don't have honor killings, except within the communities that have come indeed from that part of the world, Muslim countries where the families and the community believe in that. I think if we want for feminism and for the rights of women to succeed, I think we really have to make a distinction between those parts of the world where we have actually achieved what we wanted versus those parts of the world where they have infanticide, 
where little children at the age of eight or nine or 10 are married off by their parents, the people they love and their own communities, where women's genitals are cut off, come on, where people are stoned, women are stoned because they've had sex before marriage. They're stoned because a woman is raped. America is not Afghanistan, it is not Somalia. If we don't see the distinction, ladies and gentlemen, as women, we are going to fail. Well, clearly we're going to have to talk a little bit about religion now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, that's it. Let's just, go. It's wonderful. Just, it's women women just to lighten the tone for a God, second. Can I just come in? <laughs> just, can I just come in and say, uh, you know, I, I think what the last few years have shown us is that things that have been won in the West are not always a given. And, and while, you know, while you know, it, the things are relative and, and, of course, things are much worse in other parts of the world, things that we take for granted, I think we shouldn't be taking for granted because we, we've seen how things have been you know, wound back. And that's not to say that it's the same. It's not the same. And everyone has their own experience and every country has its own particular challenges. And, of, of course, in the Western world, um, the you know, subjugation is, is far less. But, you know, I have family that live in America as well, and the concerns that they have in, in certain parts about what's happening to women's rep reproductive rights, the fact that that in and of itself can be rowed back, it's, you know, what's next? Mm -hmm. So I just think things that we fought for, we just mustn't take for granted. We have to keep on, you know, fighting for them and making the case. Because people, some, you know, some people say we live in this post-feminist world and, you know, we've won it all and everything's fine. Well, actually, no, because mm -hmm. we only have to look at, you know, many countries. No, I don't want to diminish that. I just, I don't want to diminish that. I think we should fight for all of these things. I just think we can't have an, you know, say, what's happening in some of the Muslim communities, for instance, some of the immigrant communities within their households, within their communities, and what these women are being subjected to is equal to families and communities and nations that have actually accepted before the law. And there's a long way to go. I don't think there's anyone, a long way to I don't go. Think but don't, anyone don't on this panel, I don't think anyone on this panel is saying that America is yeah. Afghanistan. I don't think anyone no. here is saying that. Well, you know, when what, they, what they I'm put on saying, these handmade cell things, and I say, this is, okay, I, handmade I, cell, you look at Iran or Saudi Arabia, great. But you say Gilead is in Britain or Donald Trump's America, I find that, you know, it's distracting. It distracts from the real suffering that millions and millions and millions women of women go through. Well, and it trivializes it. What and it, it just really, it is so incredibly, incredibly destructive to pretend that what's going on in Afghanistan, what's going on in Somalia, what's going on in other parts of the Middle East is equal to what's going on in America. Is I, Donald can, Trump... Can, uh, can, I, can, I, can I jump is on that? Is he an oath? Yes. But has he put women in prison? Has he ripped us apart? I am, I has he taken away our credit cards? No, he didn't. Come on. I think, I think there's a misunderstanding. Yeah. As I said, nobody on this panel is saying that Afghanistan and America are the same thing. And when we talk about Gilead, we're not saying that it is in America. What we're saying, what I'm saying at least, is that it can happen anywhere. Be vigilant. And it would be this kind of, you know, in a way, confidence, if not complacency, to think that these things will never happen in the West, that we can never go backwards, that is a mistake. Yeah. We have seen that that is a mistake. 2000s, early 2000s, full of optimism. Do you remember, we had so much trust in the digital world, right? I completely so, agree with you. Please allow me to finish. There was so you. much trust that I remember at the time, a young yeah. couple in Egypt had named their young newborn baby daughter Facebook and the family <laughs> and the family in Israel named around the same time named their third child again to honor digital technologies like so that was the time when I still think about what happened to those teenagers their children or almost teenagers now Facebook in Egypt and like in Israel what is their life like because right. fast forward I think we have entered the age of pessimism and what we're seeing right now this is not a coincidence as I said wherever there is a rise in populism we will see a rise in sexism even in beautiful Spain a country of joy a country that celebrates pleasure right we see with the rise of the Vox party these buses being rented hired and drawn around the country with a picture of Hitler and underneath hashtag feminazi mm. so the argument is feminists have gone too far mm. they are deliberately conflating these words like feminazi LGBT totalitarian mm -hmm. saying that we've gone too far and we've destroyed traditional family values mm. there is a reason why in Italy conference after conference is being organized with money from evangelicals right yes and to promote traditional family values and Salvini is talking about this why we need to increase our population so we won't be in need of immigrants mm. come on this yeah. is happening in front of our well, eyes. Well, I think what we can agree... <laughs>
I think what we can all agree on is that God is definitely a bloke. I mean, just think of all the things women go through from when yeah. you get your periods to yeah. when you, you know, you're pregnant, you swell to sumo wrestler proportions, then you childbirth where you stretch your vagina, the customary, what, five kilometres, then mastitis, then the menopause, then just when everything goes quiet, do you know what happens? You grow a beard. I mean, how can that be fair? So I want to ask you all, how you think, you know, how much you think religion is at fault for well, holding it, women back in the world. But let's start, I think we should start with Lou. You go first, Lou. Um, I, well, I mean, there's, there's different strains of different religions. So it's, you know, it's how religions evolve or don't keep up with the times. Um, you know, uh, th there's many examples of where, um, you know, I don't, I don't need to tell people the history in the room of, of, of where we find ourselves today. And... And so many of what the reasons why women have been held back have, has been because of religion. But um, I certainly think that, you know, I see examples all the time of where, you know, people are trying to, uh, within the religions, honour honor, honor the, the religious practices at the same time recognising we find ourselves in the 21st century. And it's a difficult path to navigate. Um, I, mean, I don't have all the answers, mm. but I, I certainly think that in, in recent years, if I think about some of the communities that I've worked with yeah. um, in, in Liverpool, uh, where I'm a constituency MP, you know, there's a real effort going on to, I suppose, keep up. And also because religions themselves, you know, if we look at um, the numbers of people that attend church, you know, it's, it's massively dwindling. So, you know, those religions have to look at how they keep up with the times as, as well and understanding that, that our societies move on mm. um, and develop and evolve and that religions have to do so too. But of course, I mean, there's, there's, there's countless examples we can point to um, over the centuries that show the, the challenges that mm. religions have brought and they've often been at the heart of so many wars that we see across our world. Of course. Yes, religion, I, I agree with you, religions are different. Um, let's start with the proposition that God is a bloke mm. and um, religions, especially the monotheistic religions, but religions in general, um, have had um, the uh, privilege of keeping women subjugated. And it is with religious arguments that women have been subjugated over the centuries. But religions are no longer the same. So in the name of Christianity, and what happened? Uh, Christians emancipated themselves from the idea of their block gold, and the Jewish people are have done it and are in the process of doing it. But the big pink elephant in the room is Islam. And it's Sharia law. And if you look at Sharia law, let's be honest with that. If, you, if you're a true feminist, you go out and you say, it's in the religion of Islam and it is Sharia law that some of these things are happening today, that women are being forced to marry. They have to have male guardians. Even when they're as wealthy and privileged as the wife of the ruler of the UAE, uh, even with that kind of privilege, you see them running off because they can't. They do have to have a male guardian. Um, their testimony is worth only half of that of a male. Mm -hmm. um, the entire system of norms and customs and laws is all about making the woman, the female, inhuman, subhuman, and subordinate to men, basically a slave. And some of these women are sometimes treated worse than you would treat your pets. And that's the challenge of today. The biggest challenge, not the only challenge, but the biggest challenge. Mm. And if we don't shine a light on that, if we don't call it out Islam, Sharia, and exactly mm. what happens in its name, then feminism is not worth its name. Alif, do you want to? I think we're all shaped by our own journeys, personal journeys, our own. Um, oh, sure. All of us understand that we all have our own stories and they're very precious. So I'm thinking also about my own personal stories. I was raised by a single mother and my maternal grandmother. Uh, so by two very different women. But there was a time when I spent a little bit of time with my paternal grandmother and maternal grandmother. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because these two women, at the first glance, they're both Turkish, they're both Sunni, they're both Muslim, and they couldn't have been more different. So one of them is uh, you know, based on sin, fear, Jalal God, and the other one quite the opposite. Even if my two grandmothers can be so different, you know, imagine the, the, the range of diversity across the Muslim world. There is no doubt in my mind that the Sharia law is incredibly problematic and based on discrimination of women, and I think we should talk about that, but also see that there's a huge diversity across the Muslim geography, and there has always been that. What we need to talk about, I think, in my opinion, is orthodoxy, is certainty. 
you know, this fetishizing certainty, that is a very dangerous thing, wherever it comes from. And I think in that regard, I always felt closer to agnostics, you know, and to mystics who are a little bit of misfits. And I think if you bring the mystics of all religions together, they really would break bread together. These are people who are walking a very fine line between faith and doubt. So someone like Meister Eckhart or Rumi or Isaac Luria or Abu Lafia, right? These people were saying very similar things at very different times. So it would be a mistake, in my opinion, not to understand that diversity. We definitely need to talk about religion, the problems that comes with religion. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, religion has no role in terms of shaping our public space. So for me, secularism is incredibly important. And I think particularly for women, it is very precious. Mm -hmm. Well, being Australian, the only religion that we have is sun worship. I highly recommend that. <laughs> uh, but um, I suppose I wanted to ask you, all of you, I mean, we've talked about how many pressures women are under in the world and how do all three of you who are activists and so passionate and so, so vital to the, the cause of promoting women, how do you keep your optimism? I mean, I'm beginning to think optimism is, is an eye disease. How do you keep your spirits up? <laughs> Do you want to yeah, so, so it's been really important to me, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is what other people should do, but it's been my choice to support the next generation of women. So, you know, when I was elected at 28, you know, was, uh, a lot of people said that, you know, I was far too young and um, I couldn't do it. And, you know, every, every reason out of the book, and even still, you know, I get that thrown at me. And, you know, trying to harness the, both the optimism and the confidence and the excitement of, you know, the women coming through is really, really important. And for women to know that, yes, of course they can do it, uh, to provide them with the, both the tools and, and, again, promoting their own confidence to put themselves forward. So, I, for example, I'm, I'm involved and have been for a number of years with a number of different mentoring schemes. Mm. I've been mean, involved with three. So every year I, I mentor a different woman from different schemes. I, I'm in the... I went to Birmingham University and, and, for example, that's one of the schemes where I support um, the next generation coming through. And to see that, you know, it's, it's about, you know, people talk about smashing those glass ceilings, and it's making sure you provide the ladder for the next generation to come up. Mm, um, so I'd be really involved in that. Well, I keep my optimism by asking myself every day and being thankful for what I have, number one. I also keep my optimism by looking at what we've actually achieved. That's why I say, look at the free world, and here's us women what we have. And then I keep my optimism also by looking at the number of women who are standing up for their rights, many of them young girls, really, standing up for their rights in the world that I come from, and thinking, well, 100 years ago, what we now call the free world, that's where women were, and now look where we are. And if I can see, this is what we can achieve, and I look at these girls and I tell them, this is what you can achieve. Critical thinking, stand up for yourself. Don't be hostile to your brothers and, you know, males. I, I, what my sense of what I think we should achieve is not let's subjugate men. It's let's achieve equality, let's achieve parity. If we can achieve that, and I know we can because I can see we have it, many of us have it, check our privilege, then I remain optimistic and I can pass that message on to the women who are struggling to come out of the situations in which they are. Uh, they don't have what we have. We still don't have equal pay, not quite parody, but anyway, what were you going to say, Lou? Yeah, you know, I'm Turkish. I can't be an optimist. It's, it's not in my genes. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly think if you open a map of Europe and if you trace it with your finger, you know, the blue Danube, the Danube River, Ooh. as your finger moves from Germany towards Black Sea, the level of optimism drops. Right. <laughs> so by the time you reach Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, <laughs> Black Sea, Turkey, you know, we're not, very, south. we're not very optimistic people. <laughs> but I think I am a big believer in what Gramsci used to talk about. He used to talk about the pessimism of the intellect mm -hmm. and the optimism of the heart, the optimism of the will. And I think we've entered an age in which we're going to need both because mm -hmm. being pessimistic intellectually is going to make us more aware and more alert. We will see that we, we can't take anything for granted. We can go backwards mm -hmm. very fast and we need that kind of pessimism in order to keep us engaged in the public space. Mm -hmm. But if it's too much pessimism, that will also pull us down, and that leads to either anger or apathy, mm -hmm. and none of those roads is the right way, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So the optimism that we need is going to come from the heart, and I think it comes from our fellow human beings. You talk to people, young people, minorities, of all kinds, sexual, ethnic, cultural minorities, when, when I hear their resilience, when I connect with their stories, 
then I have more optimism. I really think we need a healthy dose of both pessimism and optimism today. And scepticemia. We should be chronic, we should have chronic scepticemia. Yeah. Yes, now I we've got about 15 minutes left if anyone would like to ask some questions of this incredible panel. Yes. Have we got a little mic? Thank you. Luciana, um, you obviously left the Labour Party earlier this year, and I'm, I think we do somewhat disproportionately focus on the bad behaviour of Conservative men. Um, the Conservative Party has obviously had two female leaders, one most recently who's been quite badly treated, I think, by some of her colleagues. But I'd like to hear your experience on the other side of the aisle, because I think there's a, certainly what I hear, there's a lot of problems there as well, and I think we do focus sometimes on the boorish behaviour on the conservative side, but not on, on the other side, so. Sure, I mean, I'm more than happy to talk, I could do like a whole hour on why I left the Labour Party. <laughs> um, um, and uh, I'm happy to take, pick this up afterwards. I, I wouldn't say it's to do with, I wouldn't say it was like a feminist stroke sexism issue. I think all parties, you know, have got their, their issues to sort out. You know, the reasons why I left the Labour Party, first and foremost, were because anti-Semitism wasn't and still isn't being contended with, and also because of Brexit. Um, and yes, you rightly point out the Labour Party hasn't had a, uh, a female leader, but when I was elected in 2010, we were exactly 50% new women Labour MPs and 50% men. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why we have 31% women in Parliament today is because of the work that the Labour Party did to um, bring forward all women shortlists. Yeah. And I'm all for a different method if someone can find me one, but as long as that's the only method that ensures that we readdress the balance, that's the things that we have to do. So I wouldn't, you know, I'm more than happy to, to talk about the issues in the Labour Party, but I wouldn't characterise them as issues on, uh, to do with kind of women. Although I would say at the moment, you know, we meet today when, um, and uh, in fact, one of my uh, inspirations is Margaret Hodge. And we've just, heard, anyone that might be following the news might have heard that she's now subject to a trigger ballot. It was another woman, Diana Johnson, that was, uh, has been sub subject to this trigger ballot thing where you know, people left in the Labour Party having to spend a disproportionate amount of time having to kind of stand again for their seats when they are brilliant MPs. So I think there's lots of different connected issues about why it might be the case that women are the ones that are kind of out there. I think this is just a general issue about our politics. Um, and we know that when women put themselves forward, when, they, you know, when there isn't a women's shortlist, that for whatever reason, people will tend to pick men over women. That still characterises selection processes, not just in our country, but across the, you know, the Western world. So we've got a job to do. Um, and again, I think it comes back to the initial point I made about those concentric circles, where again, you're subject to disproportionate amounts of abuse by being in public office if you also find yourself as a woman as well. And, and that, is, that permeates more, more broadly and widely than just within the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Oh, there's... Right there. Thank you very much. Uh, so one of you mentioned that masculinity is a straitjacket, and um, research shows that a lot of men actually feel the pressure to be masculine from the women in their lives. And we know, of course, that overwhelmingly white women voted for Trump in the 2016 election. Do you think that women are ready to let go of masculinity and its trappings as a backstop to the women's push for power? Well, I happen to see masculinity as a good thing. And I think women should not let go of masculinity. I think men should be masculine and women should be feminine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think when, as feminists, we start saying we need to be treated equally before the law and with dignity, we are not supposed to diminish men's masculinity as we don't want men to diminish our femininity. I think this whole thing about uh, masculine toxicity and all the rest of it is hogwash. It's, it's Marxist nonsense uh, that's masquerading as equality. And I think we should just throw it out the window. Uh, but unfortunately, I know we won't. I, uh, I'm going I'm gonna to disagree with that. <laughs> <That's laughs> I, have, I have both masculinity and femininity inside me, you know, and I think we all do. And that's one of the things we forgot to say. And that's one of the wonderful things that actually in 1960s and 1970s women's movement used to talk about. Maybe we need to remember that emphasis on multiplicity. So when we read people like Audre Lorde or, for instance, James Baldwin, remember what she would say, Audre Lorde, look at me, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm lesbian, I'm a mother, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm many more things you might not be able to see at first.
first glance, I contain multitudes. I think that's so narcissism I think, in its best. No, you know, this no, is no. <laughs> we all we all contain multitudes as human it's beings. Narcissism, in it, it's, it's worse. But okay. I, I I have multiple belongings. You have multiple belongings. We are not reduced to categories like this clear cut. So I think it's important to understand that yes, masculinity can be a straight jacket, and I think there are different forms of masculinity. What I know and what I've seen over and over is in a patriarchal culture, it's not easy to be a woman but it's not easy to be a man either yeah. particularly a young man you know and there's a lot of pressure on them too so again we can talk about these things we can talk about the dangers of extreme masculinity toxic masculinity this is the right time for us to have all these conversations <coughs> together without dividing ourselves into artificial tribes yeah good answer did you want to add to no, it no i think okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lady there who's had a hand up just no. It's a practical question. And then really. the lady in front who's had a hand sure. up all the time. For Luciana, really, um, in terms of what do you, or what's the Liberal Democrat Party going to do about equal pay? So again, quite localised, particular to the UK, but also is it possible to get, get transparency on pay from private companies? I mean, it certainly is possible, but you have to have, unfortunately, you might have to have laws in place to achieve it. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of discussions and debates that we've had in Parliament about uh, certainly, you know, companies over a certain size should be publishing you know, what they are, you know, their, what the gender pay gaps are. We're starting to see that already. They should also be publishing what well, we can already see, but they should be actively trying to address the imbalance on their boards. That's a massive issue as well. Um, in terms of the actual policies, you'll appreciate that all parties at this moment in time are looking at their. Um, uh, manifestos, you know, we're expecting a general election at some moment in the not too distant future, but the Liberal Democrats themselves are a party that wants to have an open, tolerant society. So I, I couldn't tell you exactly what was in the last manifesto, but I would anticipate that there would be something very, you know, firm in there to address the issue of, of equal pay, which, you know, is still a, a challenge that we have to address. You know, we, we get to a moment in this year where women are uh, having to work more to achieve as much or to. Um, earn as much as men and until we achieve that equality. There's, again, it then leads on to the wider, bigger debates about women um, and parents, in fact, and this issue about shared parental leave, I think, is, is, is the start of a journey about how we ensure that we value the contribution of parents and it doesn't just, doesn't just fall to women that are left to um, raise children. So, again, there's lots of public policy things we can come up with and should be coming up with and we've started with that we need to do more to make it... Uh, able for both parents to make that contribution. Um, yeah. Jennifer McDermott, Chair of Justice, Freedom Fighter, LGBTQ, all sorts. So first, Margaret Atwood, when I read her dystopian novel, The Handmaid's Tale in 1986, and I was doing the spy catcher case on my own with a trainee, she changed my life. I was not going to be the handmaid to the Lord, and the Lords were my partners in my law firm who then adopted when I decided to have a thing about... Sorry, I won't... I will no, ask we a just question. need to get to the question. A question. The OK, question? Yeah. I'm sorry. So I do... I agree with you all, but the person who has most disappointed me today because I thought I nearly adopted Sharia law, but I didn't because we don't want to bring the bad into a good system. I just don't understand... I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name with the red jacket. Oh, yeah. I just haven't really understood your position because I think you could be setting us back. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not setting us back. I'm saying, please, for heaven's sake, as women, please, let's see what we have in the developed, wealthy, Western, liberal democracies. We have, by law, by custom, by practice, we are way more privileged than in the countries outside of that. And if, as women, and as feminists, we continue to see ourselves only as victims, then we will be victims. I hate to disappoint you, but there is a victims. difference. I there is, my dear, a difference. There is a difference between women who live here and their situation and women who don't. Women in Muslim communities who are struggling with, can I just go to school? Can I be the boss of my own body? Can I? We, if we appreciate what we have, what we fought for and what we gained and continue to fight, that's my position. The position that I'm against, and I don't think Atwood meant that with her uh, novel, was to show that if, you be, if you're wholeheartedly victim, 
and you think of yourself only as a victim, and we live in a time when victimhood is celebrated, fine. But if you, if you choose to be the victim, okay, maybe then you're you going to be the victim take of your oppressor. Later on We're in not the, victims. In the side. Let's have a question from over here. Hi there, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, my question, basically, so you, I, from listening to you speak, you talk a lot about these sort of very big transcendent issues, but I was just wondering what your take would be on sort of really zoning in on, say, like in England, like in the UK, where we do have sort of, we're equal before the law with men, that kind of thing, but I would argue that does, that doesn't necessarily always transcend down and sort of filter into people's mentality, where you do then get instances of everyday misogyny, that kind of thing. And I was just wondering what your take would be on that in terms of then, in terms of education and from a very young age, in terms of, oh, I don't know why my voice is shaking, um, in terms of then how you educate people from a young age to combat that. Should we have four minutes for that? Yes. <laughs> so your question is how do we help young people to, yes, co to understand feminism? Is that Exactly, and so to combat, even though in a country where, like here, where we are very equal in, t in sort of in in theory, where those instances of everyday misogyny do still happen in terms of, like, pass away comments like, oh, I could never see you going to, say, politics or finance, that's a man's role, that kind of thing. Well, also, we're in the, in the most famous Me Too yes. house right now. There have been yeah. so many sex scandals here. Right, we too, can so. talk about Me Too if you want to, but how would you like to answer that? Yeah, I think that the main challenge that we're facing is um, when we talk about patriarchy, it's not like written codes, right? It's not something we can take into our hands and shake in the air and say, look, this is what I'm fighting against. It is much more subtle. It's much more diffused and also internalized. We also internalize many of these gender roles. Since we are little. And there's, there are amazingly alarming uh, studies that show, particularly conducted among young people, when they take social, on their social media accounts pictures, out of 250 pictures, they choose, they tend to choose on average two or three. Mm -hmm. What happens to other 247 photos, right, that are not chosen? Well, they're not chosen because they don't like their body, they don't like the shape of their breasts. This affects all of us. Just a small example. We need to understand that patriarchy is universal. To me, as someone coming from Turkey, I also know that I have to fight harder in some other parts of the world, but we are all in this together as, as global citizens. So to, to, to talk, to bring this debate into the public space, I think this panel is very important. We need to have these conversations. Also, we need to know each other's stories. That is why Me Too was precious. And if it has flaws, I'm not saying it's not flawed, we should also be able to talk about that. Mm -hmm. The problem is today, I think we're constantly being drawn into tribes and identity politics clashing certainties. The media also likes, likes this. If you have two people with opposite views, shouting at each other, completely rejecting, well, it's good for ratings. But life isn't like that. Mm -hmm. So we can be feminists and at the same time talk about the flaws of the Me Too movement and, and see what can be the next stage. This is also perfectly fine. But I believe, if I may add this, as a novelist, you know, when I read the memoirs of people who have gone through the worst atrocities in human history, there's one thing that always stayed with me. They're saying, how come horrible things can happen? Is it because people are bad? No, actually most people are good people. You know, we're all a mixture of good and bad, but still bad things can happen. And that's mostly because I think what they're saying is the opposite of goodness is not necessarily badness or evil or wickedness. The opposite of goodness is numbness, is when we become numb, indifferent to each other's stories. So to me, it's very important that whether it's LGBT, whether it's women, whether it's minorities, anyone, let's share our stories. And let's also understand that when democracy is lost in a country, it will be very difficult to be different. For whatever reason, the color of your skin, how you look, how you speak politically, for whatever reason, if you're different mm. in a country where democracy is lost, your life will be hell. I would say to you that we are on the Me Too thing, the Me, the me Too, I, so the, the Me Too story started in, it, it's very much, it was very much started in the workplace, where there is a man who has more power than the female. And the female is then forced to accept the sexual advances because if she said no, then that would mean she would lose a job. And I think we should get to a place where a woman can say no, and her no means no, and she can walk out. That would be for me a huge achievement. That is what we need to work at. And for the rest of it, I mean, we have very little time, but I don't think the Me Too should be hijacked 
to start, uh, you know, the mission drift of talking about other things, you know, Brexit and Trump and all the rest of it. That's not what Me Too is about. If Me Too is about the advancing of the rights of women, then it should advance the rights of women. It's the well, place to say no. I'm so sorry to tell you, but we are running out of time. This panel could go all day. Yes. But I think you'd all agree with me that the, all the women here, although we have different views on some things, yes. we are combined in our belief yes. that we want to help other women. And I want you to give a big round of applause to the human wonder bras up here, <laughs> uplifting and supportive. Um, the last thing I'd say is that um, Elif is going to be signing her wonderful books over in, in the bookshop. And if you wouldn't mind skirting out that way, scooting out that way, that would be brilliant. Thank you very, very much for coming along. <laughs>